Hi everyone, this is Nurse Anna from NurseStudy.net and today we're going to be discussing inflammatory bowel disease. Inflammatory bowel disease, also known as IBD, is an umbrella term used to describe two inflammatory disorders of the digestive tract, one being ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. IBD is a long-term condition characterized by diarrhea, rectal pain, abdominal pain, fatigue, and weight loss. In ulcerative colitis, it refers to a condition that involves inflammation and or ulceration of the superficial lining of the large intestine and rectum. The areas involved are continuous and not patchy. As opposed to Crohn's disease, it refers to an inflammatory condition affecting a deeper layer of the intestinal lining from the mouth to the anus. The involved areas do appear patchy. Inflammatory bowel disease can occur at any age. However, it is more commonly diagnosed in people between the ages of 15 to 40 years of age. The condition can be mild to severe and it can cause serious complications. The signs and symptoms of IBD vary depending on location, severity of the inflammation or ulcerations. They can range from mild to severe with periods of remission. Some of the signs and symptoms you may see is persistent diarrhea, abdominal pain or abdominal cramping, rectal bleeding, bloody stools, weight loss, extreme tiredness or fatigue, and reduced appetite. Inflammatory bowel disease is idiopathic, which means no known cause. It has been suspected that diet and stress are the causes behind this condition. However, studies now suggest that they are only aggravating factors. It is believed that IBD is caused by defective immune response and genetic predisposition. Age. Most IBD cases are diagnosed in people before they turn 30 years old. However, some cases can still develop after the age of 50 or 60 years of age. Race and ethnicity. People of Hispanic and non-Hispanic white descent are at higher risk. Family history. Having a close relative with IBD is a risk for developing the disease. Cigarette smoking. Now listen before you make any judgments. Cigarette smoking is known to prevent ulcerative colitis. However, its known benefit far outweighs the harm that it can cause the person's overall health. The use of NSAIDs. The use of NSAIDs is known to increase the risk of IBD and worsen the symptoms for those who are already have the disease. Complications from any type of IBD. One would be colon cancer. IBD increases the risk of developing colon cancer. Screening for this type of cancer typically begins between 8 and 10 years of having IBD. Inflammation of the eyes, skin, and joints. Conditions such as arthritis and skin lesions are often associated with IBD flare-ups. Side effects from medications. Some of the drugs used to treat IBD are related to the development of cancer. Also, Medications like corticosteroids can cause high blood pressure, high blood sugar levels, and an increased risk of osteoporosis. Some other complications of IBD, we have primary sclerosing cholangitis. IBD is associated with the development of primary sclerosing cholangitis. This is an inflammation that causes scarring of the bile ducts resulting to further complications such as liver damage, blood clots. IBD also increases the risk of clots forming and blocking veins and arteries. Anal fissures. This refers to a small tear in the tissue surrounding the anus. It can get infected and cause further problems like pain during defecation or perianal fistula formation. Toxic megacolon. This refers to over distension and dilation of the colon accompanied by bloating, fever, pain, and sometimes shock. Other complications from any type of IBD, perforation of the colon. This can occur secondary to toxic megacolon. However, it can happen on its own. Severe dehydration. This condition can occur as a complication of severe diarrhea. Now we'll talk about complications specific to Crohn's disease. Bowel obstruction. Crohn's disease can cause thickening of the bowel wall causing obstruction. If significant, surgery may be required. Malnutrition. The symptoms associated with Crohn's disease, such as diarrhea, reduced appetite, and abdominal cramps, can all affect food intake and nutrition. 
a deficiency in iron and vitamin B12 is common in people with IBD. Fistulas. A fistula refers to the abnormal connection between two organs. The damage caused by Crohn's disease to the intestinal wall can result in these abnormal connections causing infection and abscess formation. Diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease. The diagnosis of IBD comes after studying the results of imaging studies and endoscopic procedures. Also, physicians may perform stool sampling to rule out other possible causes like infection. Endoscopic procedures. A colonoscopy. This is a procedure to examine the entire colon. It involves the insertion of a thin flexible camera through the anus into the colon. It can also be used to obtain tissue samples for biopsy. It is the study of choice for diagnosis of, of ulcerative colitis. And then we have a flexible sigmoidoscopy. This procedure is similar to a colonoscopy. However, instead of studying the entire colon, only the sigmoid or the last part of the colon is assessed. This may be favored over the full colonoscopy in cases where the colon is severely inflamed. Upper endoscopy. This test uses a thin, flexible camera that is inserted in the mouth to assess the esophagus, stomach, and the first part of the intestines called the duodenum. A capsule endoscopy. This test is used to diagnose Crohn's disease. It involves swallowing a small capsule containing a camera. Images are then transmitted to a recorder that can be worn on a belt. Balloon-assisted enteroscopy. This procedure is performed when the results of the capsule endoscopy come back inconclusive. It is similar to a simple endoscopy. However, this procedure uses additional equipment called overtubes. This piece of equipment allows doctors to reach further down to the intestines. Imaging studies. These may include x-ray, CT scan, and MRI to diagnose IBD. These studies provide images that may suggest inflammation, perforation, or other anatomical abnormalities suggestive of IBD. Treatment of IBD. The treatment goal for IBD is to reduce inflammation and control symptoms. Treatments include medication and or surgery. Now we'll move on to medications used to treat IBD. Medications. There are several groups of medications used to manage IBD, such as anti-inflammatory drugs. Anti-inflammatory drugs such as steroids and amino salicylates are the first choice to treat IBD. Immune system suppressors. Drugs that suppress the immune system are also used to treat IBD. Biologics. These are newer drugs used to treat IBD. They act to neutralize the protein that causes the inflammation. Antibiotics. Antibiotics are useful when infection is suspected in cases of perianal Crohn's disease. Supplements. People with IBD may also be prescribed supplements to support nutrition. Malnutrition is common in IBD since intestines are mostly responsible for nutrient absorption. Surgery. Surgical procedures are usually the very last resort of treatment for IBD. The surgical procedure varies depending on the areas affected by the disease. Surgery doesn't cure the condition, but it greatly relieves the symptoms. Surgery often involves the removal of the diseased portion of the intestines and establishing a connection between the healthy intestinal regions. It may also include the closure of fistula and or drainage of abscesses. Now we have over 300 nursing study guides, uh, which include nursing care plans, articles on nursestudy.net. So feel free to go to the website and look at the care plans to help you through your nursing school and your nursing studies. But we'll do a sample care plan here for IBD. Nursing diagnosis. Diarrhea related to inflammation of bowel as evidenced by loose watery stools, abdominal cramping and pain, increased urgency to defecate, and increased bowel sounds. The desired outcome? The patient will be able to return to a more normal stool consistency and frequency. Intervention. Commence a stool chart. Use a standardized stool assessment tool such as a Bristol stool chart. Rationale? to monitor the patient's bowel pattern. Intervention. Administer medications for inflammatory bowel disease as prescribed. 
rationale to help decrease the frequency of stools and alleviate diarrhea. The doctor may prescribe anti-inflammatory drugs, first line of treatment for people with inflammatory bowel disease, immune system suppressors, and they work by prohibiting inflammatory response by suppressing the immune system. Intervention. Encourage increase of oral fluid intake is tolerated. Ideally, at least two liters per day. Avoid cold drinks and check to make sure the patient is on, on any fluid restrictions before doing so. Rationale. To help ensure the patient will not have dehydration due to severe diarrhea. Also, cold drinks can increase intestinal motility. Intervention. Help the patient to select appropriate dietary choices to reduce the intake of milk products, caffeinated drinks, alcohol, and avoid high fiber, high fat foods. Rationale, to relieve abdominal pain, cramping, alleviate diarrhea, and to promote healthy food habits. To avoid flare-ups of inflammatory bowel disease, high fiber and high fat foods can cause irritation in the intestines. Intervention, Start the patient on an MPO status and gradually progress to clear liquids followed by a bland diet and then a low residue diet. The patient can then have a low fat residue, low fiber diet on a long-term basis as recommended by the dietitian. Rationale, nothing by mouth status can help rest the bowel by decreasing peristalsis. Gradual progression from MPO to a low fat, low fiber diet can help manage the symptoms of inflammatory bowel disease. Other possible nursing diagnosis would be fatigue, ineffective coping, risk for deficient fluid volume, and anxiety. And we have samples for all those care plans on nursestudy.net also. Okay, that concludes our IBD lecture. Please visit us at nursestudy.net for care plans, practice exams, and study guides. We'll see you next week. Bye.